book readings with Miss Bernard. Hello everyone and welcome to day 25 of our Black History Month series. Today's story is Sweet Justice, Georgia Gilmore and the Montgomery Bus Boycott. Written by Mara Rockcliffe. Illustrated by R. Gregory Christie. Let's begin. Georgia was cooking when she heard the news. Mrs. Rosa Parks had been arrested, pulled right off a city bus and thrown in jail because she wouldn't let a white man take her seat. That was no surprise to Georgia. She had lived her whole life here in Montgomery, Alabama, and she knew there was no justice under segregation. Segregation was a long, hot summer dragging wishful children past the shady park with the whites only sign. It was the pale pink hands of waitresses serving white businessmen their lunch, as if it wasn't Georgia in the kitchen cooking up Montgomery's best meatloaf and her famous sweet potato pie. And the city buses standing on her aching feet all the way home after a long day's work with rows and rows of seats up front left empty just in case a white person got on. But Georgia didn't ride the buses anymore. Not since the day that driver shouted at her to get off the bus and go to the back door after she'd already paid her 10 cent fare. Before she could get on again, he slammed the door shut and drove off. More than a month had passed and Georgia hadn't stepped onto a city bus. Walking home was even harder on her feet than standing, but she would not give that bus company another dime. Come Monday though, she wouldn't have to walk alone. To protest the arrest of Mrs. Parks, the radio was urging everyone to stay off city buses for one day, December 5th, 1955, a boycott. Something was cooking in Montgomery and not just Georgia's black eyed peas. Monday morning turned up cold and gray, fixing the rain. A hard day to ask folks to walk, but as the empty buses started rolling by, Georgia could see that it would be a fine day after all. A very fine, cold, rainy day indeed. That evening, Georgia headed over to a meeting at the Holt Street Baptist Church. Seemed like all of Montgomery was there, upstairs and downstairs, spilling out onto the streets for blocks around. Mrs. Parks herself could barely manage to squeeze through the crowd. A young minister named Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. stood up to speak. Georgia knew him. He lived on South Jackson Street a short walk from her house on Derricote. When he had special company, he'd hired Georgia to fry up a batch of crispy chicken for his guests. Tonight, Dr. King wasn't talking about chicken. He was talking about justice. He said, my friends, there comes a time when people get tired of being trampled over by the iron feet of oppression. He said, the great glory of American democracy is the right to protest for right. He said, we are determined here in Montgomery to work and fight until justice runs down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. Everyone agreed the boycott must go on. Walking with others now, walking to make a change, Georgia hardly even felt her tired feet. Still, many people couldn't get to work or school without the bus. Car owners offered rides, but who would pay for all that gasoline? Georgia and her friends piled up their money, 50 cents from one, a quarter from another. It wouldn't buy a lot of gas, but if Georgia used it to buy chicken, she would whip up some mouth-watering sandwiches to sell at the next Monday meeting at the church. It turned out that Dr. King was not the only one who couldn't resist Georgia's crispy chicken. 
As fast as George's basket emptied out, the collection plate filled up. Sandwiches were just the start. Georgia moved on to dinners and then cakes and pies. Soon she was selling them all over town. Georgia knew that many people wanted to help out, but they were scared. They could be threatened by their neighbors, fired from their jobs or worse. So Georgia called her friends the club from nowhere and she kept their help a secret. Nobody would know who slipped her a few dollars or dropped off a chocolate cake. Monday evenings at the church, grim-faced policemen sat up front, taking down names. Georgia didn't pay them any mind. Shouts and stomping shook the pews as she presented all the money she had raised from nowhere. <laughs> the empty buses made city officials hotter than Georgia's collard greens with pepper sauce. They didn't like to lose those bus fares, but they didn't want to change. They sent out the police to ticket anyone who gave the boycotters a lift. People were arrested just for standing on the corner, waiting for a ride. Georgia made more pound cakes and banana puddings to help pay their fines. Then in February, they arrested Dr. King. It was against the law, they said, to organize a boycott that had no just cause. No just cause? Georgia couldn't fight this battle from her kitchen, so she put on her Sunday suit and went down to the courthouse for the trial. Georgia told the judge about the bus driver who took her dime and then drove off. What kind of way was that to treat a paying customer? Bus riders might look different, Georgia pointed out, but everybody's money was the same. Georgia's testimony didn't save Dr. King from an unfair verdict, guilty. But the journalists who packed the courtroom took her words and other details of the trial to the world. Suddenly, everyone was talking about the struggle for justice in Montgomery. Everybody knew the name of Dr. Martin Luther King. And Georgia? After she was quoted in the papers, she was fired from her job. Dr. King encouraged Georgia to start working for herself selling lunches out of her own kitchen on Dairy Coat Street. He even gave her money to buy pots and pans. At Georgia's place, everyone crowded happily around her table or squeezed side by side onto a couch. And if they couldn't find a seat, well, even standing up, they found the spare ribs and the stuffed bell peppers tasted just as good. Georgia's wasn't just a place for eating, though. It was a place to meet and talk and plan. Spring had come, but still city officials wouldn't budge. Fortified by Georgia's sweet potato pie, the boycotters were determined to stay off the bus. Summer heated up, frying the sidewalks like a pork chop sizzling on one of Georgia's pants. The boycotters trudged on. Fall passed with cold mornings and the comfort of hot rolls from Georgia's oven. The boycotters plodded on. Georgia was cooking when she heard the news. The Supreme Court of the United States had ruled that segregated buses were unconstitutional. On December 20th, 1956, Montgomery was ordered to desegregate its buses. From now on, all riders could sit anywhere they liked. After more than a year, the boycotters had won. Now, some folks in Montgomery said they had never tasted anything like Georgia's chicken. Some declared that could be nothing more delicious than her pie. But that night, they tasted justice. And nothing else Georgia cooked up would ever taste so sweet. The end. All right, this has been another book readings with Miss Bernard. I hope you enjoyed this wonderful story. And I hope that you come back tomorrow for day 26 of our Black History Month series. As always, have a wonderful, beautiful, amazing day. Bye bye.